Yeah, 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 yeah. She'll be back in uh, uh, and can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. All sorts of wonderful things to announce. Pay attention. You don't want to miss out on some of these special deals. Half off. Okay, I made that part up. But uh, two for ones. So much to announce. Christmas Eve service is coming. Christmas Eve candlelight service. This building, 6 o'clock. Christmas Eve, candlelight service, this building, 6 o'clock. Uh, have you invited everyone you need to invite to your thing? Um, no, Christmas Day. Christmas Day. If anybody is without a place to go, you're going to come to our house because we're going to make a ham dinner. So just let us know if you'd like to come, and everyone is invited. So, yeah, Christmas Day, you want some ham dinner, dinner, you have been invited. No reason to spend the holidays alone. No. Joy and Billy, talk to Joy. Say hi, right there. Boom. There is dinner available for you. Christmas Eve, check. Christmas Day, check. There's all sorts of things going on. But wait, there's more. You should have gotten one of these lovely devotionals. A 10-day devotional between now, leading up to Christmas. Little reading for each day, brought to, through the uh, Our Daily Bread company there. That's wonderful. What do you think these are all about? Oh, you guys know what time this is. This is... Christmas bag time. There's all sorts of Christmas bags on that back table. And it goes like this. We, we were out traveling. And we, some guy was at the post office. Gwen was in there. And he looked at his mail and said, forgotten at Christmas again, and threw his mail in the trash can. We talked about it. You know, some people are. You know, your family can move away, pass away. Things can happen, chasing jobs. You find yourself alone. On the holidays. In fact, my son talked about when he first went to college. The holidays could be, you know, but he had some friends, so he pulled through. But uh, so, what is in this bag? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> a lovely Christmas card from the church, followed by, oh, what? This is a uh, candy cane pen and uh, what's this? Notepad, notepad. Lovely microfiber towel for cleaning. We, we're trying to mix up so everyone. Everyone likes something. Chocolate. Chocolate works. Everyone should like chocolate. Oh, what, there's more. Here's a lotion. There's a chapstick. Here's a little squeezy ball for those people who like to squeeze things. There's an emery board. Car freshener. Flashlight. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much MacGyver could do a whole show working out of this bag right here, right? And so what we did and decided to do is you pat, you take one, take them all. If you don't have a Christmas gift this year, your gift is on that table over there. If uh, Gwen's going to be all upset, I'm not going to get this back like I was. Yeah, perfect. Uh, if... And what it is, is you just take one or two. This doesn't have to be a chore. It doesn't have to be difficult. I know this is harder for introverts and extroverts. But your job is to give it to somebody. And it's just that easy. Somebody. It doesn't have to be the most impoverished person you see. And it's okay if they're a well-off person. If you want to give them a little gift, boom. These things we've given to 7-Eleven clerks who are working on Christmas Day, Quick Mark. You know, cookie mark clerks who work on Christmas Day. One time there was some left. Gordon and I passed them out to the truck stop on Christmas Day. People just waking up and they're at a truck stop waiting for the pass to open. Merry Christmas. You know, and you should see their eyes. They're just looking at a brown bag. They don't even know what's inside of it. And just the thought is enough to, to encourage someone. So this started as a tradition many years ago and continues on to this day. Though we, uh, we were talking, we did have to up the budget on them. Because of inflation, uh, we were trying to spend five, six bucks a bag. And, uh, you know, there's 72 bags. Yeah. And uh, they couldn't get, we couldn't do much with five, six bucks anymore. You could have the towel or the pen. You couldn't have both. You know, so... Uh, <laughs> And so it's been a wonderful tradition the church has done. And there's been times I've gone into 7-Eleven to give the clerk a bag, and someone's already beat me to it. Well done, church. Well done. Starbucks clerk, I don't care, guy on the sidewalk. If there's a couple of them, I've had them out to the wigwam employees. 
you know, just. In fact, uh, sometimes I'm sad because all of them are gone and I can't hand out any out around the neighbor. I've even walked down the street handing them out to neighbors. You could do the same. In fact, you've got a grumpy old neighbor on your street, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Where's Ray? Okay, he's not here. Uh, Don, you'll be our grumpy old person today. So you see Don out there doing his grumpy old man thing. Go ahead and give him a bag. You know, just um, uh, you know, whoever else, grumpy old men you may be. Then we also have some a little paper back there on the back table. And how do I wake this thing up? Awake. Wake up. Oh, and it wants some numbers. No, I don't want that. Come over here, Amber. Oh, 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 oh. No, okay, I lost it. Where did Amber go? Amber! <laughs> it, it, it went to sleep on me. Yeah. So we have a, a bunch of little papers on the back table there. There's a family, if you want to help support. We know through the MOPS group. And there's a, a family, have a different, a mother having a difficult time restarting. Uh, for her sister. I really can't describe how much this means to me beyond helping, uh, and even beyond making, helping make Christmas special. I've struggled with feeling uh, aloneness and struggling with decisions of health, finances, housing, schedules. Uh, on my own and hearing encouragement in this case helps immensely. So we argue if you want to help participate, there's an Amazon list. You can go to it, those little paper tabs over the table next to the coffee machine. And you can take one and try to help this family during their Christmas thing. Anything else that needs to be announced? Or forever hold your peace. All right. Let us sing some songs to the Lord. It's Christmas time. Good morning. For the record, Don is the opposite of a grumpy old man. <laughs> <laughs>
Good morning. Miss Twyla is recovering at home today, but she is doing so much better, and we praise God for that. I know that she thanks each and every prayer warrior that has been praying for her. There are also other good news. Hester's brother, is that right, is out of ICU and doing so much better, and to the power of prayer, we are thanking God for that. Um, so many other um, answers to prayer. We just thank God that he cares enough to hear us and, um, and answer. Thank you, Lord, for that. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you. We thank you, God, that you care for each one. Oh, God, that you would be with those that are sick or recovering, God. I ask that you would just touch their bodies, continue to comfort them and give them peace during this time. Lord God, I pray for those who are grieving. Oh, God, we lift them up to you. We ask that you would hold them and keep them, Lord. God, I pray for um, those who don't know you this season, Lord. May they come to know you in a powerful way. God, that they might see what this season is about and change their heart toward you. Oh, God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We, God, we thank you for your blessing of joy that it might abide with us this season. May your blessing of peace rest upon us, oh, God. And may the blessing of love flow out to our community and our world because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, please stand with us.
Please have a seat. Now, I don't know, in fact, I'm pretty sure this has happened to everybody. It's one of those common things. Let's say a group of us go out and check out a new restaurant. There will be the majority opinion, and then there's always the other guy. You know, most of us will say it was pretty good, or my delicious, was, my meal was fantastic, or maybe you ordered the wrong. But there's one guy you just can't make him happy. Same could be said if you go to a movie. Well, that's kind of normal. But what I'm going to talk about today is one event, one event, and three different outcomes. One event, three different outcomes. <clears throat> Namely, the birth of the Messiah. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, reading in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, and everyone go, oh, okay, King Herod. 
No, 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 guys. Like, we're, we're, we're talking about like Darth Vader here. So when I say King Herod, you guys go, oh, okay. King Herod. Thank you. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And verse 2, asked and asked, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And there is a lot of conjecture and thought of who are these wise men, these magi, who are the, you know, why? But we do know a few things just from the text. They knew enough about, they saw a sign, and they knew it represented the king of the Jews was born. And that's what they came looking for. And uh, King Herod uh, was kind of the king at the time. So he's king of the Jews. And here they are looking for a new one. That could be a bit upsetting if you're just finding this out. You know, like the new guy comes to work and says, I'm in charge of such a department. And that was the department you were in charge of until right now. You know, kind of, it could be one of those kind of things. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. Uh, we, we see the stars, so we kind of worship them. Verse 7. Uh, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And this lets you know there was actually some time period between when they saw the star, they said from the east, when they traveled uh, to Jerusalem to see these things. And maybe even more time you thought, most of our nativity scenes have the wise men right there at ground zero. Not necessarily the case. It's good to throw them in there. They're part of the big package. We're reading about them here. But they're not always in the exact same scene at the exact same moment. Uh, in fact, someone on our little manger scene outside, I have the shepherd around the corner, you know, because I ran out of wall space. That's what happened. But someone said, why did you put him out here? I'm, I'm quick thinking, like, because they were in the field. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Herod called him. When did, he, verse, uh, when did exactly this happen? Verse 8. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, because they, they, they knew it was going to be, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. He knew from prophecy, Michael 5, too, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, a descendant of David. And he's telling them, what did he say? Go find them, report to me, and I too may go worship him. They were going to go find him and worship him. He wants to find him and worship him. Then we read in verse 9, After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. So they'd seen the star which brought him here, but here it is again, it sounds like. And it takes them right to where the child was in Bethlehem. I'm sure Bethlehem wasn't huge, but a big star beaming down upon it really doesn't narrow down what house you're supposed to go to. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Look at they're being led. Verse 11, on coming to the house, he was born in a, they're coming to a house. It could be the manger was part of the house, or this could be later on in time. Plus the fact, yeah. <clears throat> And they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, it does say gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is still a wonderful gift if you want to send some. That's fine. Uh, frankincense and myrrh, some of those are lost on us today. I don't really see a lot in the, in the places I go. But they're both technically like tree sap. Right? Both frankincense and myrrh. And because a particular tree has its particular enzymes and oils and everything else, uh, frankincense is often used in perfumes and incense. Myrrh is used similarly, but also, uh, I read it, it seemed to have some medicinal purposes. Who knew? Who knew? So you have these ointments. If they're from the east, frankincense and myrrh come from different trees, mostly in the 
what do you call it, the Sinai Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, and across the Suez into some of those Eritrea, Ethiopia countries. Just that general area is where these trees are, two different types of trees. Now, I didn't realize that perfume could come out of a tree. You know, I just, I haven't harvested a lot of perfume, but it made me, it reminded me, I was in Alabama many years ago, and we were visiting Uncle Willard, was the man's name, and we're in his garage. And on the wall was a wooden plaque and had all the little drawn cutouts so each tool could fit in its exact place. And there were all these twisted, handheld-looking things. I couldn't imagine what you worked on with those for. And so I asked him. It was for bleeding trees to make turpentine, which comes from a pine tree. Though I think he said sycamore. They were doing something with sycamores, too. But hey, it was a long time ago. So pine trees produce, when you cut the bark, they try to heal, whatever they do, and that sappy goo gets in there. That sappy goo can be turned into turpentine, a cleansing, cleaning agent. So it, I, you know, I thought about this one. I wonder how many other things I'm splashing on my body and spraying around the house that came out of tree bark. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Frankincense and myrrh. But a dream... They had warned them to go back to Herod and return to their country. And I'm thinking, they saw a star that led them there. They saw a star that led them again. And they're having dreams and stuff. This was a big week or month or whatever it was for them. You know, however long it took them to travel from their country. Now, also in Matthew, verse 13, next one. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now, I mean, they just had a dream. Now, Joseph's having a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Verse 14. So he got up, took the child, him and his mother, during the night and left for Egypt. And I, you know, I watch a lot of stuff. And there's always someone saying, well, that couldn't happen. That didn't happen. That's unlikely, you know. You just can't pick up and run off to Egypt anytime you want to. Traveling was hard. Roads weren't good, you know. I'm guessing if you have enough gold, you can, you know. It's right there in the story. They got some cash, you know. Just silly thoughts. But you always hear these, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? A lot, I mean, if they have enough gold, it makes perfect sense. They could travel. You know, I'd do more traveling if I had more gold. I think we all would. Verse 14, so he got, yeah, took the child and they left for Egypt. Verse 15, he stayed there until the death of Herod and so was filled with the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. Hosea 11.1. 1. He's quoting Hosea 11.1 1 as a messianic prophecy talking about that God's son would also come out of Egypt. Interesting, how can he be born in Bethlehem, as a descendant of David, that prophecy, and this one where you're in Egypt? But indeed... The story makes it work. It, he was both. He was born in Bethlehem, and he's calling him out of Egypt, Hosea 11.1. 1. I think I've told you before, some of the Masonic prophecies are much more clear, some are more veiled, more, more vague, but there's so many of them that are pointing towards one person. Verse 16. Here comes another Herod. Are you ready? When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity where, who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So now we see in this verse that they saw the star. It took them quite a while to get there because he's actually going back two years when they first saw the star, it sounds like. That just doesn't put the wise men down the street from the nativity. It puts them in another county or state, you know, another zip code, clearly. <clears throat> now, right about here, again, watching the different skeptics and critics, uh, nowhere in recorded history is it mentioned that Herod killed off children. Therefore, it didn't happen. You'll hear that. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't recorded. That doesn't mean he didn't do it. It just means we haven't found that recording. So uh, people say he didn't do it. What do we know about Herod? What do we know? You search the word King Herod. Now, this, 
I got to explain to you, there's multiple Herods in the Bible. There was him, he had some kids, some of his grandkids come show up in the Bible, it's like four of them total. Uh, King Agrippa is a, is, a, is a Herod descendant, Philip the Tetrarch is a Herod descendant, All, you know, and they'll say Herod the Tetrarch. What well, does not mean this guy? This is Herod the Great, Herod the First. <clears throat> he started off B.C., a couple years B.C., became a, what they call it, a vassal king. He's king, but he's owned and operated by Rome. And he did actually a massive building project in Israel. They say he was good about, for a couple of things. One was getting the economy going and building things. And technically, I'm not trying to give credit where it's, but you can say that about some fascist leaders. They might have been horrible when it came to keeping people alive, but they did actually could do some beneficial things, be it highways or water systems or things like in their reign of terror. Not all of them, but you know, it is possible to do some beneficial things uh, on top of everything else. Uh, Google search found this. Herod was a cruel and crafty man who, was, who permitted no one, not even his own family, to interfere with his rule or prevent the satisfying of his evil desires. A ruthless murderer, he had his own wife and her two brothers slain because he suspected them of treason. I think her of adultery. That was his, he had like ten wives, but that was his favorite one. Had her killed and her two brothers. She, however, became convinced that uh, she did not really, uh, he did not really love her, and relations between them had turned. Eventually, Herod's sister convinced him that uh, Mar 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 uh had planned to poison him, and the wife was executed. Herod's sons fared little better. <clears throat> far, excuse me, far, a little better. Two of the sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, had fat, fractious uh, relations with their father, who suspected them of plotting against them. Eventually, he brought them up on charges of treason before Augustus Caesar, who allowed Herod to convey a court and try them. They weren't the last of Herod's. Oh, yeah, they tried them, found guilty, and they were put to death by strangulation. These are his sons. Remember, he's already bumped off the wife, brother-in-laws, which, of course, that makes sense sometimes, depending on your brother-in-law. Uh, that's a joke. That's a joke. And speaking of jokes, I was joking when I said that Don was the grumpy old man on his street. <laughs> Stan is actually the grumpy old man on his street. He's just not old enough to qualify. <laughs> Let the truth be told. It's yeah, tr true. <laughs> Dropping truth bombs 24-7. <laughs> so uh, he's bumped off. Oh, here he is oh, now. They went the last of Herod's sons we had killed. His firstborn son, Anna Pater. Born of Herod's first wife, for many years was favored by Herod and heir to the throne. But he, too, was eventually brought up on charges for plotting against his father. He was executed just five days before Herod died. Five days. He almost made it. Herod was almost gone, his reign of terror. But five days before another son was. And then... Uh, in view of such executions, the Emperor Augustus reportedly quipped, and this is Emperor Augustus, Caesar Augustus, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Uh, and that's actually written down in a commentary sometime later, uh, Macrobius and Saturnalia, chapter 2, I think it is. The joke being that since Herod was of Jewish lineage of some sort or another, he's kind of mixed, uh, he didn't eat pork. So if you were a pig at his house, you had a better chance for survival than his, cat, than his pig, no, than his own son, I mean. He, he's not going to eat pork. And in, in the language, it's actually those two words are really close. It's weus and something. Uh, and so it's kind of like saying it's better to be a sow than his son. You know, it kind of rhymes, kind of has a pun there. So, I mean, we look at this, and this is accepted history, uh, could he have issued a decree? There's another one told where he actually had some of the officials of the city killed when he died. Some of the best men of the city. Why? He wanted weeping in Jerusalem when he died. It's actually a story told. Uh, here's this one about these children. When the angels had left... Oh, and here we go. This is another one. So that's... We see here's the birth of the Messiah. And we just looked at what Herod was going through and what the wise men were doing. Well, there's another. Uh, Luke chapter 2, we're talking about some shepherds. Some shepherds. 
And they've just seen a whole host of angels appear. They've been told the, you know, the city of David, a Messiah has been born, you know. And Luke 2.15 says this, when the angels had left them, they'd gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, just a sm small little verse, and I'm only going to make one little point. Uh, they saw some stuff, and they wanted to see more. That's how they reacted to it. They heard about this Messiah, and they, needed, they, they went to check it out. Uh, now, this particular idea, now we talked about Herod, this idea of checking out God, of, of trying to experience God. There are some verses that talk about you can kind of do this. You can kind of learn about him. If you're curious, you can ask some questions, get some answers, find out. Psalm, these are in no particular order. I don't have them in the overheads. Most of these are heavily quoted verses. You should know them. Psalm 34, at least you've heard them. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. You know, there is, you're figuring it out. You're experimenting. You're sampling. But give him a chance. Taste and see. And what's the response? Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Luke Jesus talking says this, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Well, he's talking about looking for things, right? Asking questions, looking for things, knocking on doors, trying to get in. And if you do that, it will be opened. There's a promise that if you're curious, if you're inquiring, God's going to be there. So the shepherds were on the right track based on these verses. Another one, which uh, I always thought was interesting, and it's Acts 17 about the Bereans. Everyone knows this one. Verse 11, Acts 17, verse 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those of Thessalonica. These are classier people. Why is that? It explains, for they received the message with great eagerness and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They heard about it, they were excited, and they dug into their Bibles, if you will. And they were more, more noble, more classy, whatever you want to say. Finally, Isaiah, and this one, Isaiah uh, 118. Come now, let us reason, or let us, let us settle this. Let us get this figured out. Uh, let us settle this matter, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be white as wool. Now, not everyone, there's a lot of people who don't think they have big problems. They don't think they sin. Or if they do, their sins aren't that bad because they can find somebody worse off. And of course, you can always find someone worse off. It's not too hard. Uh, that doesn't mean you're in any much better shape. You know, the doctor could tell you stage four. Well, that's horrible. But we could find someone worse off. You just found out. They're in hospice. You, know, you just found out <clears throat> they're, they're, they're removing parts of the other person. You know, they're worse off. Does that make your position much better? You still have stage four. Well, that's what some people do when it comes to sins. They, just, they try to, you know, oh, I'm better off than that guy. I'm better off than that. I'm doing okay. Not as far as God's concerned. He wants you to live your life a certain way, and you want to do it differently. In fact, I think toddlers find this out when working with their parents. They want to do it a certain way, and their parents want to do it a different way. This is not abnormal thinking here that it happens. And in this Isaiah passage, let us reason this. Let us think this out. Your sins be like scarlet. I mean, I've done wrong, but they can be white as snow. That's fixed. So they be as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Uh, that, if it's true, that's a wonderful thing to think about. To be free from the guilt of knowing you did wrong, knowing you wronged somebody. And in doing that and finding forgiveness, you can forgive others, which frees up another part. Think about two things that drag a person's life down. Uh, things that happen to them, or, you know, can leave long marks throughout their life, long scars. And things they did and know there was repercussions that weren't good. What if you could be forgiven about what you did and learn to forgive others? What peace that would bring to your life? What help emotionally, psychologically, whatever word you want to use for it, 
Because these are the things that bring people down. These are the things that stick with people through their lives. Education doesn't fix it. You know, learning math is not going to help you in these departments. Good spelling and punctuation. It just doesn't fix these internal wounds. But knowing that you're forgiven for what you did wrong, knowing you can forgive others, life-changing. Let us think about that. Again, there's that reasoning, working it out, figuring it out, inquiring. So, uh, we have Herod, who said he wanted to go worship. But then as we read on, it doesn't sound like he was really worried about that. It sounds like he was worried about an upstart to the kingdom and wanted to bump him off. Uh, you can actually inquire about the Lord for the wrong reasons. His were very selfish, murderous. Can you imagine someone doing that? You, you go out of your way to inquire, to learn about the Lord, just so you can hate him more? Just so you can accuse him more? Well, it happened again. It happened in the New Testament. Luke 20, I'll just read it. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him, talking about Jesus, immediately. Why? Uh, because they knew he had spoken a parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. So what did they do? Verse 20, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. Were they curious about Jesus? Were they inquiring? Yes. But why? A fault-finding mission to accuse him of something wrong and to get the government involved in taking care of him. Could such a thing still happen this, to this day? The answer is yes. It still happens to this day. There are people who spend a great deal of time studying their Bibles, but they're not studying to understand what God's doing or if there is a God. Well, those are honest questions. They're sort of to prove there isn't. They're going in with a predetermined mindset I'm just looking for things that don't make sense or anything I can accuse the Bible of. So are they studying? Yes. Are they researching? Certainly. And for all the wrong reasons. They already have their mindset. I'm in here looking for errors. I'm looking for anything to say, what about this? What about this? What about this? Still happens to the state. And it's even easier now. We've mentioned before, social media... Uh, all social media cares is that you click on their button and keep clicking on their buttons because that's ad revenue. The more people are viewing, the more chances of an advertising coming up and millions of people seeing it, that's money. The more people, you know, ad revenue. Well, so they do whatever it takes to keep you clicking by, and you can watch some videos and documentaries on this, these algorithms they use to say that, you know, this person generally looks at this topic for this long. But then they often change to this topic. So they make sure that the videos that are coming up or the feeds or the news stories switch. You know, this person often spends five minutes looking about the weather. Make sure there's a weather on there somewhere. This person's interested in hot rods. Make sure hot rods over here. In fact, you should see my, my MSN page when I log in. All it has is movies and cars. Old movies and cars. You'd think that's all I'm interested in. Yeah. And, uh, and that's all there is showing Showing. Same with, uh, in fact, I, what did I look at? Oh, I was looking at windows. Windows, and I was looking at my old windows on my Pontiac. I watched a couple of videos, but they actually be about Malibus or Chevelles, which is a similar body style. They're not identical you know, to the trained eye. But, and all my feed now on YouTube is nothing but Chevelle windows. Yeah. I want to see a few of them. I don't want to see them all. But what are they trying to do? Give you what you want. Now, are they really worried about what's being true? For instance, we know this already. I don't care what political side of the fence you're on. You want to find more conservative stuff? You watch this news channel. You want to find the other side? You watch this news channel. If you want to click on certain news feeds and YouTube channels and Facebook, so they're all commentaries on this side of the argument, you can do that, or that side. You want conspiracy theories? We can find them at that. You want there are no conspiracy theories? We can find that. You want flat earth? We can find flat earth. You want round, and it just goes on and on and on. Do they care what's true? Not really. They just care if you keep clicking. This makes being the, agno the, the atheistic antagonist even easier now. 
at my fingertips, all I'm going to find is things that's wrong with the Bible. And it's the wrong search, it's the wrong attitude for any topic. You know, I hope my doctor goes in learning how to heal, not just how what's wrong with medicine. Wouldn't that be kind of an odd doctor who just studied the problems with medicine? All the flaws with medicine, how bad it can be. Now, we need studies. We need to find out medicines are working like they're supposed to or not working like they're supposed to. But uh, if I go in, I like to find someone who studied, you know, how to heal people. That'd be good. I think that'd be good if I'm going to a doctor, not just the negative sides of it. So Herod, <clears throat> motives were bad, still happens to this day. Well, then we have the shepherds. The shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. I don't know what you want to call that, but they started off good and they just keep going. They're getting better. You know, step one, step two, they're on their way. Uh, I think people can still do that today. I think they can hear about the Lord and hear about the Bible, walk in the door and start catching on. Now, would I give them a stamp and say, this person is, you know, a wonderful Christian and all that they do? I don't even know them. Would I say they're on the right path? Certainly. They're learning and they're learning for the right reasons. They're inquiring with the right questions. You know, and I said, there's two types of people I talk to a lot when it comes to Christian arguments. One is a person who asks a legitimate question. And the other is a person who just wants to argue, just wants to fight, belligerent, whatever else. So I had a guy come to me and say, uh, well, how do you know the Bible's real? How do you know if it's been translated correctly? And this is a big topic, big discussion. How do we know any book from of old has been translated correctly? How do we know any story from history has been, you know, were there really Caesars? Was there really, a, you know, a Alexander the Great? You know, and this is a fair question to ask of any part of history. I can talk to a person like that. But then there's, a, there's the other, but then there's the other kind of person. That stuff never happened. That stuff never existed. They're not asking a question. You know, tell me how it happened. They're, you know, if they do it that way, they're asking a question. But not, they don't. They don't want the answer. They already have the answer. Those people I spend less time talking to because you can tell they're already set. They're not going to weigh any evidence. They're not going to consider any options. They know that they know that they know. Uh, people do this with other things, you know. Uh, uh, all those years I delivered restaurants, I, I might deliver a restaurant, and I, I can tell you things. I am no business entrepreneur. You're not going to ask me for business advice, but just you're walking in restaurants multiple, several times, the same restaurant a couple of times a week for years, you see some things, you know. And I saw some things. And could you have a bad experience? You bet. You could have. A, I saw some stuff going on in the kitchen. I hope I, I, I've never ate that place. Right? Could you go there and have a bad experience? Certainly. I could also tell you some restaurants were on the move. I couldn't get my truck in their parking lot. Always. You know, that restaurant was happening. And not just my opinion, all the cars in the parking lot are also voting for the restaurant. Other ones, different employees every other week. Bad sign. Other ones, I knew, I knew, in fact, there was one point at the pepper mill, I knew, I knew the accountant guy's name, because he'd walk through the food dock, you know. But over the course of several years, I'm seeing him twice a week walk through. I mean, I knew the accountant guy's name was picking up the invoices. I knew the custodial guy, some of the, you know, the, there was another guy, some of the other truck drivers who show up about the same time, you know. You, and if they didn't change much, you could tell. And that's usually a good sign of a good restaurant. The employees weren't on a rotating door. But you'll find somebody who said, oh, I went in that restaurant, I got a bad meal once. And they never try again. Even if the cars are full in the parking lot, you can't convince them. And I can tell you, I said, bro, I was just in there. That place is packed. You know, those guys have been there a long time. The recipes haven't changed. Same cooks. Uh, people love that place. Oh, I'm never going back there. They shortchanged me and my coffee was cold. You know. And they're set. They're stuck. I don't care how much evidence I have to the contrary. You may want to try it again. They're set in there. Now, the... The beautiful thing about that is if you miss out on going to one particular restaurant, life as we know it goes on. You haven't missed out on much. There's other restaurants. You know? And unless it's the best possible, you know, dessert in town, I'm thinking of that key line that was at the Squawkers at one time. Or the mushroom Swiss burger from Bailey Wicks. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you'll never find another one. You'll never find another one like that key lime pie at uh, Squawkers. 
I went back and ordered. They handed me key lime pie. It was horrible. It was plain. It was average. I asked. The chef left. When the chef left, he took his recipes with him. <laughs> yeah. Every key lime has paled in comparison since that day. Though I know you got close in Nassau. Uh, so people do this. But when you're doing it with a restaurant, you miss out on one restaurant, no big deal. When you're doing it with the Lord our God Almighty, that could have some repercussions. You're missing out on things in this life and the life to come. I encourage you to reconsider if you're stuck in one camp and reason. Ask some questions. Inquire with an open mind. Is this true? How do you know? Where do we go from here? What's next? Then we have the Magi, these wise men. They saw his star, and that was enough to get them moving. One sign. I mean, they were on the move, and it looked like it was quite a journey if it took them quite a bit of time to get there. I don't know how far east they were. Oftentimes, people think uh, Iraq, Babylon area. Could have been further. Could have been Indian. Who knows? The, uh, the major scenes always have that perfectly blended racial group of Asian and black and white-looking wise men of different height and different body types. and you, know, you couldn't get any more correct if you wanted to. Uh, it says they came from their country. It was one country. It was east. My guess is they all looked similar, whatever that may be. They came to worship him, period. And when they found him, what do they do? They worshiped him. Now that, to me is proper theology. If Jesus is who he says he is, if he did the things he kind of, if he's spoken of in the past and the prophets of old and all fulfilled in the future, if you're going to listen to anybody, if you're going to inquire about any person in history, long before Caesar, long before the Greek philosophers, that would be the guy I'd start with. Because nobody else comes with that kind of credentials, that kind of package around them. So, we have Herod. He looked into Jesus, tried to find out more about him for selfish motives, the wrong reasons. We have the shepherds who heard and wanted to see more. And we have those who simply come to his feet, fall down and worship him, the wise men. Which one are you? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your words. I thank you for the Christmas story, the Christmas season, the birth of your son in a manger. I ask you to be with those here, those online, that we inquire wholeheartedly and earnestly about you. We learn, we understand, we see things. And all the more we move along to falling down at Jesus' feet and worshiping him. For it is holy and right and true. You provided everything we need to know, dear Lord. Help us see it. Help us remove jealousies and bias and do an honest search into your word and into our hearts. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.